Hello, I'm the Grub Street Lodger and I'm going to talk about what I read and indeed what I saw in April. No faffing about then, we'll start with Tristram Shandy. I was actually halfway through it at the beginning of April uh, and then I finished it. I mean, I've read Tristram Shandy before, obviously. Uh, it's a strange, frustrating, weird work. Essentially, uh, as a full title, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman by Lawrence Stern. And, and essentially... Tristram Shandy is trying to tell his life story and uh, reveal his opinions. He's conceived on the first page. He's not born until the fourth book uh, because things keep happening. And what I discovered on my reread was that where I remember this book being sort of a really entertaining mess, I think it's actually quite structured. Um, there, are, there are little sort of hints and clues to the future. But then there's this whole narrative of Tristram starting out, getting a little bit distracted, getting a little bit distracted, and then just finding the distractions fun and seeking them out. And and so the digressions reveal his life and his opinions, particularly his opinions. So you get to know him through the text by the way the text goes off in lots of different directions. And in fact, the very beginning, um, when, when his dad... <laughs> comes his his mind goes elsewhere and and the idea is that the animal spirits the sort of invigorating force of the semen sort of dissipates and although the egg is conce you know d it does conceive a child the sort of the, the the force is all over the place and as a result Tristram's all over the place and the book is all over the place and I really love the book because it's not just silly for the sake of silly it it has a, a, a structure which represents the theme, which is, you know, life's bigness, life's messiness, and, and also uh, troubles with communication. Uh, a lot of the characters have their own, it's called the hobby horse, their own sort of way of seeing things, and they won't look or see any other way. Uh, and so when they talk to each other, they're always at cross purposes. The doctor might be talking about one thing and, and Uncle Toby is obsessed with the military fortifications. Thinks it's something else and they all talk cross purposes. And and when we talked about this, because I read this for the Dr. Johnson group, there was a uh, person in particular who found that very grim and they thought, you know, it's a book laughing at huma humanity, saying that, you know, human life is, is stupid and worthless and we can't even really talk to each other. But I found it the exact opposite. I think this is a book that says, yes, hu human life is weird and, and unclassifiable and, and full of strange little detours and, and quirks and we can't really always talk to each other. But that means that the moments when we do are extra special and it's a book all about the small details everything that happens in this book happens because of some small thing that's out of place or that that goes wrong or that moves or and so it's all about how all these small details add up to make a life and how a life is lived in small details which i i actually find it a really joyful book a book about how even if our lives are small they are full and how life is 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 just uh a rich tapestry of, well, sometimes despair and, and dismay and distress, uh, but also just funny, weird little things. And that's what Tristram Shandy's about for me. I like it. Now, the next book I read uh, is part of my Naomi Mitchison um, thing I'm on. It's by her. It's called Behold Your King. And it tells the story, the 24 hours of Good Friday. Uh, so it begins with Peter trying to overhear the trial of Jesus and, and being questioned are you with Jesus and him denying him. And it ends with uh, Jesus having been delivered into his tomb and the stone sealed up and everybody just sort of sitting there thinking, what now? And what I really liked about this book is it's about what Jesus means to all the different characters. And so for the disciples, he's a leader and he's inspiring, and he's this crazy figure who's told them to let go of everything, and they have, and they barely even know how they have, and they, they, they know there's something special, and they can't... Trouble is, Jesus, he keeps talking in, in riddles, and they're like, well, what do we do about this? How do we 
understand what this guy's on about. What does he want from us? So at one point they try and rescue him because they think they think it's a test of their faith that they have to try and rescue him. They don't realise it's a test of their faith to watch him die. Uh, and they find the whole idea of him dying completely peculiar and distressing and horrible. Then there are the sort of the, the radical um, political people uh, who have been led by another Jesus, Jesus Barabbas, um, and now uh, look to this one uh, and decide to go with him because they see his political things. Then there's the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and uh, the way this book goes, the Sadducees are close in with the Romans and think that Jesus is going to cause problems, so get him out of the way. And the Pharisees were very much against him, but are warming to him. And I, I don't know if this is true, I don't know if this is tradition, but in the book... Joseph of Arimathea is a is a Pharisee who then gives him um, Jesus his uh, his his tomb. Of course, there's that other tradition that Joseph of Arimathea has known Jesus for years and years and years and brought him to Britain when he was a kid. But you know that wasn't in this. Probably most interesting, actually, is Jesus's family. So Mary, mother, is a bit of a weirdo. She's believed her whole life that this kid is is the son of God. Um, and she's just dismayed at how it's going. Because <laughs> he, he's being executed for crimes. And that's not the way it's supposed to go. Uh, and she's got this, this firmness and this toughness. And she's a little bit otherworldly and, and, and a bit scary to everyone around her. Then there's Jesus' older brother, uh, James, who is an Essene. And he's like, I don't understand Jesus' mission because the spiritual way forward is to neglect the body, forget the body, forget the things. But Jesus is always going around hugging kids and stroking cats and telling warm little stories to people and, and trying to help people. That's We're not supposed to worry about the body. You shouldn't be healing the body. We should be going for higher spiritual things. What is he doing? And then there's the younger brother, uh, Simon. Who's carried on the car the carpentry business and just thinks both of his religious brothers are nuts? <laughs> anyway, there's a lot in here. You know, it's, it it takes place over one day. It doesn't. It took me, I think, a day to read. Even, um, it's not religious in the sense that it just assumes you you believed it because I don't think Naomi Mitchell particularly did. I think she's one of those people who thought that Jesus was a, a person with a good message. Uh, but it's how that message and, and how it's turned out with him being killed is affecting everyone else. And also, it's not like Passion of the Christ. It's not just gory torture porn. It's good. My next book uh, is, again, Naomi Mitchison. It's called Early in Orcadia. It's one of um, many books I've read this month, last month, uh, to do with Scotland. And so it's about the Orkneys. Um but prehistory, so the first person to go from the mainland to the Orkneys. Well, he's not actually the first, but he's the first one to work out to do it and come back and make a settlement. And then you you get with them, and they all have like funny names. There's somebody called Bear Bum, because she walks around with a bear bum. And there's uh, Foot Foot and Handy, and they all have like odd little names. And a very simple sort of culture, a very simple understanding of family and things like this. And then there's a jump. Because I thought we were going to be with them for the whole book. But no, there's a jump. And the culture's got a bit more um, complicated. Uh, things have become a bit more specialised. And then the jump again. And now there's like a religion of pot making. And there's this and there's that. And there's more islands and they're connected. And then another jump. And they have this whole elaborate religion with the eagle woman. And the, there's... Um, in one of the Orkney Islands, there's the, the, the Tomb of the Eagles and the Standing Stones and you know, all of this. And it jumps in the development of uh, of people in the area uh, and occasionally put into place. Because like, you think, wow, they've improved a lot. But then you look at <laughs> Egypt and, and, whoa, they're still living in the Stone Age. <laughs> but but still, there's this amazing culture and it's it's all about... These people who are living there and how they live it and understand it. It's, it's sort of a, an exercise in trying to fill them and fill their way of seeing things. And as I say, picturing the complexity and the development and how uh, it goes on uh, uh, using archaeology, I suppose, as inspiration. It's a very imaginative work. It's a very interesting work. It does fall down because um, the, cause the 
there's jumps. You don't follow one family or you don't follow one person. And, and so you don't get as involved in the later people as you do at the first ones because you think the first ones are the ones you're going to be sticking with. I read that at my sister's um, and, and I read it quite quickly, quicker than I was expected. And so I started reading some stuff that she was going to get rid of and decided to keep. Uh, but the first she didn't decide to keep, it's represented by this book. It was called My Friends Are Superheroes. And it's by, I don't know, you'll have to look at the title. <laughs> I can't remember the title. And it's uh, the, the author is somebody who was involved in McSweeney's. And so it has that sort of quirky for quirky sake element to it that some people like, some people don't. I would have loved... I'm more against, but this was well done. So my uh, everybody I know is a superhero, um, namely that's that's the case. And he has married a superhero uh, called the Perfectionist. But she has been hypnotised to never see him, uh, and he has to get her back by making her see him. Uh, and the main thing is all the funny, weird little superheroes because there's the spooner who finds people who need spooning and spoons them. Uh, or the invisible people who tend to paint themselves different colours, or, uh, yeah, all these, uh, fuck it man, who has the power of saying, ah, fuck it. And in fact, most of the <laughs> superpowers are objectively not superpowers. They're just personality traits. And so she's the perfectionist because she's a perfectionist. <laughs> It's not really a superpower. And her sisters have superpowers that aren't superpowers either. And you get the impression that their their upbringing was a bit, you know, uh, rough and ready. And uh, they've responded by being these people. In fact, the main character probably has the, a superpower because there's frequent times when he is disassembled like a robot. Uh, but he doesn't think of himself as such. And yeah, essentially it's a, it's a big metaphor... Um, of 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 a relationship of how you know you gotta you gotta help the person in the relationship see you uh and then just this silly superhero stuff to give it a bit of flavor if it was much longer than 100 pages it would have been quite irritating uh but at its length and its thing it was it was really good i it was a nice little book and then now book she Faye was given away <laughs> Gobelino, the Witch's Cat by uh, Ursula Murray Williams. So it's a children's book. Um, Faye read it during her penguin uh, thing. Penguin puffin readathon. I read it at her house. And uh, it's, as she said, it is quite repetitive because it's essentially a Bildung's Roman about a cat called Gobelino who's born a witch's cat but hates being one and goes around trying to be other things. Uh, and it never quite works because his essential witchy catness comes through, uh, which he hates. And uh, it it gets a bit weird in this sense because so he hates himself. It's, it's almost like a, a story of body dysmorphia. You know, the cat hates his essential being and isn't happy until he's no longer a witch's cat. Like bodily, truthfully, you know. Uh, it's almost like, I don't know, trans people having, you know, gender recognition surgery or something. He, he he can't live in the body of a witch's cat and he needs to make it not a witch's cat. And then all these people keep uh, calling him out and uh, dead naming him and stuff. I'm sure that's not what the author had in mind, but that's, that's how it came across to me. Uh, a very odd book in that sense, I suppose. Uh, the next book, also a children's book that Faye was given away that I read, The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. Uh, Faye said it's essentially a toy story, which it kind of is. It has snooty mechanical toys. Uh, toys come to life. Toys uh, become real when they are loved. Um, uh, and it's all about realness. And, and uh, you know, for a very slim children's book, there's some interesting philosophical ideas of what realness is. Is realness being seen real by one particular person? Is it uh, an actual state? Is it a state of mind? Is it just looking like a real thing the mechanical toys think they're real because they have moving parts and stuff is it is it something like that um yeah the whole notion of realness was kind of fun and then the kid uh he gets scarlet fever and, and the poor old rabbit toy needs burning uh and that was just kind of odd to me because scarlet fever's doing the rounds again uh, uh we've had a few kids at school who've had scarlet fever so there you go 
The next book, also a children's book, but one of these sort of children's adulty books. A bit, well, it's called An Edinburgh Reel by Iona McGregor. And it was recommended to me by, here comes the name, Leon Garfield. And uh, he had her write a short story in, in uh, his collection of short stories. Uh, and it was quite a good one. It was all about somebody conning someone out of some laundry from the drying fields. And he said that her writing was, was wonderful. And so I got this. And I looked her up and I thought, oh, she sort of stopped writing books and started writing study guides. What's this about? And it turns out that she was uh, a lesbian who was a teacher... And she had to hide it. And so when she was writing this, she was hiding that. And then and then she she found she could get more money by writing study guides. So she could quit being a teacher and become out and do a lot more uh, uh, sort of active ac activism. <laughs> yeah, activism. I thought it was a yogurt for a second. <laughs> yeah, a lot more of that. Uh, and, and in the end, uh, she, she found this society called AD. Uh, which officially stands for Anno Domini, but amongst the members stood for aged dykes. Uh, and, and, and so this this career of writing children's books sort of passes her by because she's got other things to be getting on with. However, this book here, it's the first of my Jacobite trilogy um, that I've, I've been reading. As culloden has been around this time, so why not? And it's set five years after Culloden, um, uh, a girl who was who was young when when it happened has now grown up uh, into a young woman is entering Edinburgh society despite the fact that you know her relatively not particularly wealthy privilege but relative privilege of being a um, when she was a girl has been stripped away because because her father went off and joined Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, and now he's come back from service in France and he wants to get his land back and he wants to start life again. And they go to a cousin called Lord Broadmere, uh, uh, and her father starts working for a linen company, which he finds thoroughly degrading because you're a good Highlander. Uh, he farms, he fights, uh, and he owns a pub. Uh, he does not. He's not a clerk for a linen company. Uh, at the same time, she's falling in love with a, a law student, but there's a, a dark side. You see, her father before he he went off to France and and became sort of a member of the the court in uh, in in exile was in fact imprisoned and put in a in a hulk brig and the person who was treacherous um he wants to hunt him down and find him in fact the the identity of this character is really obvious within the book it's not much of a mystery but it does add uh, attention and a, and a motor to it and um you know he's got to ask himself what he wants out of life now uh, and she's got to ask herself what she wants and and so it's a post colonial everyone moving on kind of book and it has a happy ending and it's very pleasant and it's well written and there are tons of fun scottishy kind of words you know wished and uh mcclappers and all sorts of odd little words that i enjoyed uh, also odd little words also set after the jacobite rebellion um and also about reconciliation and moving on, but definitely not for children. This is The Bull Calves by, again, Naomi Mitchison. She's become a new Leon Garfield. Uh, and so this is set a couple of years after the 45 in a place called Glen Eagles, which is sort of just on the, the join between the Highlands and the Lowlands. And the Haldane family, who are Whiggish, Lowland, you know, Tory, uh, not Tory, um, government supporting family, with members who were part of the 15 rebellion and things, they all come together. Complicating this for them is a rather foolish innocent who was part of the 45 has come to hide uh, in their house. Uh, he, he only joined because he was offered the chance of, uh, of making the currency and he wanted the opportunity to do that. And he was actually a real person. He's called Bob Strange, Robert Strange. He's hiding there. There's a guy called Lachlan of McKerney, and he has bad feelings for the family and will do anything to wind them up. And then there's Forbis, who is the uh, essentially the Prime Minister of Scotland, and he makes a sudden arrival, and that makes everything more complicated. So that's the plot, but most of it is about the conversations and the atmosphere and the feeling. Our main characters really are a woman called Kirsty and her husband, William. 
They've been married for uh, only a little while, uh, but they are deeply, deeply in love. And they're both on their uh, second uh, spouse, and they've had a horrible time before it. So Kirsty, she was very, very religious. She married this, uh, this Presbyterian minister who was a hellfire-spouting, uh, nasty, physically abusive, horrid man who, who dragged her around different places where she never fit in. And in the end, she joined a witch coven and believed she killed him with witchcraft and was about to sell herself to the devil, who she calls the Horny, which I found very funny. Um, and when the Horny came in, it was William. Oh, it wasn't the Horny, it was this, the William guy. And William has, uh, after the 15, ran away to America. He's holding in his heart a torch for Kirsty. But he's uh, tried to set up a, a township for Scottish people um, that hasn't worked. And then he's run off and joined Native Americans, part of the five tribes. Can't remember which tribe. Uh, and, uh, and he's had a lovely time with his wife until the, the slightly, well, the horrid version of parts of their lifestyle um, just just shock him so when they go out on a raid and they capture prisoners of war it's tradition to essentially dismember them dip their their blood in maize cakes and eat it in a kind of disgusting communion and so it horrified he's now run away from america um and and gone off and married Kirsty. and in them there's a, a lowlander and a highlander with this uh, wisdom and love born from much pain and experience who have to find a way to reconcile the past and move on. And that's essentially what the book's about. How And what's amazing is the most authentic um, historical novel I've ever read. Like all the characters completely think of their time, but there's a whole range of them. So it's not like everyone, everyone from that time thought the same. So there are strong women. You know, it's not all, you know, little domestic... Things and he, and even you know women who are strong in the domestic sphere and things like this and then there are people who are pro slavery and against slavery and it's not even because of you know morals it's because of well you know the way it's set up and there's this there's that and and you can believe that everyone is thinking what they're thinking because of their personal history and because of their place in history uh, it's really real feeling and it's wonderful and also the last um, big chunk of the book. Uh, are, oh, there you go, that much of the book, are notes by um, Nomi Mitson. And it's a bit like having her over for the book group and just have her explain what she what she thought she was doing, what her influences were, what, what she was interested in at the time. She wrote this over the Second World War uh, from 1940 to 1947. So, you know, amongst other things, but she kept returning to it and, and so on. Uh, and and so there's also an element there of well how does the world move on after World War Two so the, yeah it's, it's some relevance as well as just complete authenticity it's a really real feeling book it's great next uh, and and last book of the month Midwinter by John Buchan it also involves Jacobites uh, and also Samuel Johnson in fact I thought it was a book where Samuel Johnson decides to become a Jacobite and goes off. Uh, but no, it's about a Jacobite who's come south into England in order to secure um, you know, alliance and, and, and support. Uh, and as he's doing this, one, he meets a man called Midwinter, who's a lot like Cock Laurel in The Virtue of the Jest. So he's a sort of pagan king of the old English. There's a certain lingering Wicker Man element to it, even though Wicker Man was actually Scottish. But this is a whole inversion because it's all about the, the civilised lowlander going into the terribly barbaric uh, England, snug middle in England. So, you know, uh, it kind of fits. And then it meets a, a man who, who was a writer in London and has been a, a schoolmaster or a tutor. And this is Samuel Johnson. And it's a young pre-dictionary, pre-fame Samuel Johnson. And for me, it was the main part of the book because... It, it describes him in his awkwardness and his shabbiness and his uncouthness and how he twitches and rolls and spits and moans. and uh, Yet, he's also a fierce boxer and a, a very wise and intelligent person in this, in this completely run-down, destroyed body. 
Uh, and it's a really good depiction of a young Samuel Johnson and, and what it might be like to meet him without the baggage of what he later achieved, you know. This is just a weird man. <laughs> and that's how he's portrayed. And it's all buried, not buried, it's all uh, part of this exciting um, spy story because uh, there's there's a traitor that, that McLean has to find. Uh, of course you know how it's going to turn out because you know how history turned out but there's still a, a tension in it because it's so now to all the characters there it's very good midwinter cool bonus playtime not as many this month the first thing i went to see then was sister act and that was why i was with my sister to see sister act i went down to up to sheffield and we watched it at the lyceum uh we had a lovely meal beforehand you know we did the whole thing and uh, Sister Act, very catchy, very fun. They've done some odd things. They've uh, relocated the time period to the 60s and the sort of Motown type thing. Which, you know, the songs were always those in the film. But it was because she was like a tribute act. But now it's then. And so all the music has that kind of flavour. But none of the music from the film is in the musical. So they don't do My God or any of that. But they had their own ones. It was very good. And weirdly, the best songs were, were probably the ones for the goons. who um, They had one about uh, chatting up nuns. Uh, and they had one about uh, what they do to Dolores when they find her. But it was all done a bit like The Temptations. So it was like, I will stab her, stabby stab, 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 stabby stab. And it, you know, the incongruity was very funny. Uh, they also had the guy from... Um, well, I think I know him from some Doctor Who things, but he was in Tracy Beaker, and he um, was the policeman who, uh, younger and hotter in the film, it has to be said, who who ended up copping off with Dolores, and it was like, oh, uh, he was great, he was really good in the role, and it, it, the policeman was like a shy policeman who was finding himself, uh, but... The, the sort of age, or at least the attractiveness levels between her and him were so vast, it was a bit... <laughs> that said, it was a really, you know, just a really good fun night out and a good show, and um, one I wanted to see, but just hadn't got round to, so I was pleased to see it. Uh, and the next thing was, uh, I reviewed it. It's called Quality Street. It's by... Uh, there's a little, uh, little program. It's by J.M. Barry, and it's what the chocolates are named after. And it's just a fun little um, nostalgic look um, at Regency stuff. And so the a man and, and a woman, they love each other very much, but don't declare it. And then he goes off to, Waterloo, to the wars and to Waterloo, and she has to keep herself going by becoming a teacher. And when he comes back, he sees her, and she seems so drab. And so she pretends to be her niece who's sparkly and fun and they, they get together and then there's the problem. Well, what do we do about this niece? And it's it's just a fun, silly, farcical comedy. What they've done, so originally this was um, performed in Halifax where the sweets are made or were made. I think the factory's shut down now. And so they got factory workers to watch the play, recorded everything they said then included it in the script so the actors become the factory workers and they comment on it and this just slows it down really and makes it longer and doesn't do very much to help it and then at the very end one of them says to the other so do you think this this play says anything about love in the modern day and the other one goes no nah, not really as like, oh well you know if you just presented the play <laughs> that would have been a bit better it didn't need all this other stuff. But it, it kind of makes sense in Halifax, I suppose. But there's no real connection between Quality Street, the play, and Quality Street, the chocolates. Except for the fact the chocolates named themselves after the play and the, the figures on the box were uh, based on the characters. But there isn't really a link. Yeah, anyway. Uh, the next thing I reviewed was called The Rotting Heart. I don't have a program for that. That was a post-it note. Uh, and that was uh, an hour-long one-man show. Uh, I described it as the gay werewolf thing, uh, but it wasn't. So two men fall in love in the 14th century, I think it was. And as they fall in love, they start changing. 
and one becomes like a wolf, but the other becomes like a were stag. It's it's more of a um, Ovid's metamorphosis than uh, the wolf man, uh, and as they do so, their bloodlust, his the wolfie's bloodlust comes out, and and he chases the stag and he eats him. And uh, I don't know what this is supposed to say about gay romance. <laughs> uh, it's dangerous and it hurts, uh, I guess, but. There was a lot of stuff about the intolerance and stuff. It was it was not a bad little show. It was all right. Uh, the next thing I saw was at Wilton's Music Hall. This is the cover, which I think is a, a wonderful picture. Um, if you can guess from from this, oh, that it was Sweeney Todd, but it wasn't Sweeney Todd the um, the musical at the same time. It was Sweeney Todd the eighteen forty eight uh, Dibden script. And uh, there is music in the script, and there are songs in it. But And also, weirdly, the script came out before the book was finished, the original String of Pearls book, so the ending's completely different. Uh, but to see this at Wilton's and this uh, melodrama, it was a, you bringing back the melodrama and all this sort of, ah, villain, you have killed me, and all this stuff. It was great fun. It was really good. And the way the music sort of talked to the characters and uh, all of this... It, Honestly, I had such a good time with a bit of Sweeney Todd. I did like that a great deal. And then the last thing I went to see, and I got another program. I'm liking this program thing. Uh, it helps to write it up for a start. Um, it's called Glory Ride. Uh, it's a new musical. Uh, it had been the, the songs and some of it had been workshopped at the other palace, but this is the first sort of proper version of the musical. It's a fascinating story. This guy called Gino Bartoli, he, uh, cycling superstar, won the Tour de France twice after the longest gap between wins as well. Uh, still holds the record on some of the mountain stages and stuff. Uh, not like I sound like I know what I'm talking about. But I get it, Jess. He's big in, in cycling. Uh, but also, he was using his, um, his, his training as a cover to uh, to to deliver and courier secret messages for uh, for for the resistance during Mussolini, uh, and so he is one of the the righteous among nations uh, by Yad Vashem, and he is uh, he's, he's regarded as a hero for that as well. And this was his story, and what a brilliant story! And loads of the songs, um, lots of songs. It was about. 22 songs in the show and they were really good and there was some great there's a one called uh, promises all about promises being broken which i think could stand on its own outside of the musical and then there was a whole bunch of good ones as well 800 souls which was all about or the, the priest thinking of all the souls who are at risk in his his um his group and uh, they were all great but every single part of it every single song had an emotion level of 10 and from the very beginning so you introduce the characters and then this, this accident happens and it whoosh, ramps it right up. And from then on, <laughs> everything's happening at this level here. And there's no respite. And so you're exhausted by the end of it. I said it's like climbing uphill on the bike the whole time and there's no bit where you get to go freewheeling down. Even the fun song was intense. <laughs> uh, and so I'm not saying it was bad at all. It was really good, but it was just so... A lot more hard work than it should have been. But yeah, uh, that's what I saw. That's what I read. It's been a good month. And I think you can see it. Maybe it was my... my I've, I've gone for a walk for two days in the sun. But I am looking a lot healthier at the moment than I've looked for a while. Pleased with that. That's good. We like that. More of that in the future, please. 